want to welcome everyone to the first uh, of our series of, of Institute Encounters. These are casual conversations with the speakers uh, who we bring each year to the Institute. Um, uh, our speaker today, the first speaker for the 2013-2014 academic year is uh, Dr. Denise McCoskey, who is Professor of Classics at Miami University in Ohio. Um, and uh, she is an authority uh, on a great many things, uh, but uh, the subject of her lecture today uh, will be race in the ancient world, uh, but she also knows a good deal about gender in the ancient world, so we'll be discussing both of those topics here, uh, here this, uh, this morning. And uh, what I hope to do is to uh, uh, discuss some things that perhaps she won't be getting to in her lecture. So, uh, first off, as a, as a general question, um, you know, we think of racial issues and gender issues and sexual politics and all those things as, as very much kind of contemporary mm -hmm. preoccupations. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a lot of people looking at antiquity or being asked to look at antiquity uh, might wonder uh, whether these were preoccupations in antiquity as well, and if so, to what extent and, and how. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe you can just sort of give us a, a kind of overall view of that terrain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that um, to bring questions from the world we live in is a great thing to do. But I think also, as you're kind of hinting at, as historians, we have to wonder about some of the differences as well. So I think that um, questions about identity broadly have really emerged in many different fields of historical studies, and that includes classics, beginning in the 60s and 70s, and people started to try to think about the kinds of people that we weren't usually talking about when it came to the ancient world. So what would it mean to fill in some of the gaps and try to find some of those people and to figure out how the ancient world included them or excluded them or how it they made the ancient world possible? And I think that um, that's both a, a, a wonderful thing to have, which is a genuine interest, but it's also important to really disentangle those modern conceptions of it and to try to think about what these concepts might have meant 2,000 years ago. And I think one of the great examples of that, in my opinion, is the study of ancient sexuality, which now it has been, I think, really taken up and people more and more understand it. My students have a general sense of it, although they need more information, in the fact that sexual identity was very different in antiquity. So there's not really an idea of homosexuality versus heterosexuality. And once you start talking about that, how identity in antiquity involve different ideas of sexuality. It really helps students think that why is it that we've ended up with the ideas that we have today. And that includes race and gender as well. So those ideas are certainly important in antiquity, but they don't always look like what we think they're going to look like. And I certainly make the, that argument about race um, in the book. That well, let, let's, let's, let's take that first. Okay, we'll be speaking sure. about that later at length. But um, you think that the concept of race uh, is something that's applicable to an Absolutely. interpretation of the Absolutely. ancient world. Uh, and you think that um, the ancients themselves had an analogous mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. notion. Mm -hmm. uh, but it wasn't quite the same notion mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. as we've had, say, in the last hundred years right. Uh, right. In, in the West and, right. and, in, and in the world. So uh, how was it like the concept mm -hmm. of race that we have today, mm -hmm. uh, like enough to be able to mm -hmm. speak about it as a mm -hmm. notion mm -hmm. of race, mm -hmm. But uh, unlike in a manner that uh, gives it a, a different kind of dimension and operation uh, in the ancient context. Right. I think that um, if we think about race as, and this is also like gender as well, as, as a kind of way of structuring and organizing what we think about human variation. So what is it that makes people different and how can we organize those ideas and how can we classify people according to those ideas. And that's really what I take race to be. I think often we confuse race as a concept with our own model of race, which is to say that we tend to think that racial ideas based on appearance and skin color are somehow the only definition of race. So what I was trying to do was to keep that general sense of race 
but ask, as you're saying, what happens, do the ancients really rely on skin color the way that we do, or is there some other way that they explain human variation, use those ideas, and often, as we do violently, I mean, there's, there's often ways in which racial ideas um, contribute to inequality and violence in ways that we, that we talked about before. Um, so that's really what I wanted to think about. Instead of saying, as was sort of acknowledged in classics around the 70s and 80s with the work like people like Frank Snowden, who really made the argument that the ancients did not think of skin color as a way of distinguishing humans. So you've talked about race before whiteness. Is yes, that, is that yes, that's phrase? exactly. Yes, that's I think that that's very good phrase. Um, yes. So why don't you explain what you mean by that? So I wanted to, you know, I, I have an affiliation with Black World Studies at Miami, so I've been able along the way in classics to do more and more reading about more modern approaches to race. And one of the things that emerges is, as you hinted at before, um, that our modern conception of race really comes out of the modern 18th and 19th centuries, and especially the 19th century. So when you say that out loud and you sort of think, well, therefore, why are we asking questions about that version of race and imposing it before that period of time? So if race becomes so associated with skin color in the 19th century that we still think of it that way today, what happens if, and I use the language of excavation, how can we excavate racial ideas that happen earlier than that? Could you do in the, in the 20th century have the example of the the Nazis, Aryans versus Jews? Yes, which is absolutely, not absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I think that that's... Um, the difference between sort of how race has been mobilized and our modern um, sense of race, which is inconsistent at times and, and often uses skin color as an alibi for a lot of other ideas. If, if one wanted to say that race is a conception uh, of what might in other contexts be called tribalism, mm -hmm. do you think that's what fits the ancient mold? That it's a tribalistic conception of difference that they was operating in the ancient world? I think it's, 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 and that's where we run into all these questions of vocabulary. What's the best vocabulary to use of other periods without using a vocabulary that overdetermines our perceptions? And I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of work in um, the 20th century about the intersections of race and nationalism and the ways that they can often go hand in hand. And I think that that's really important in antiquity, that mm -hmm. this idea of Greeks is, is a race, but it also has a lot to do with politics. And it has um, a lot to do with, um, maybe not religion so much for the Greeks, but, but it has these other components to it. So I think naming it then becomes a, a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of what I wanted to think about in the book, that I think that part of what I like about the term race is the more we look at it today, the more dimensions it Let's has. Let's get the title of your book right. Okay. <laughs> uh, you, you, so you're the one to do that. I, right, okay. I, I think so I know the, what it is, but yes. I'm going to really get So the, the book is called Race, Antiquity, and Its Legacy. And it's in a series of books that was really trying to rethink these major concepts of modern life, um, what they were like in the Greek and Roman world, and how that still impacts our view of these ideas today. So the, the major part of the book is really thinking about what race meant in antiquity, how we can find it, the different places we can look from literature to archaeology. Um, to ethnography, but then the final chapter really does try to think about how have ancient ideas about race really infiltrated into the modern era. Um, so I can try to trace um, that legacy, as it were. Um, so for the ancients, I mean, and obviously the Greeks and the Romans were two different absolutely, absolutely, peoples, right. but uh, for the ancients, uh, race would have at its kernel meant what? I think it meant a, a way of thinking about and imposing, really, um, a kind of categorical, di categorical difference, a way of saying this is who we are and, and these people are different from us. Um, and not as good. And not as good, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And, and one of the things I try to do in the book, which I think is, is often left out, is the idea that race is also a way of thinking about Greekness, for example. You know, it's not just a way of thinking about how the Greeks use these ideas to talk about Persians, especially in light of the Persian Wars, but it was also a way that they used to think about what it means to be Greek. So I think that that's a really important piece that often gets um, left out. You can see that today when people engage in things like whiteness studies. You know, how does white emerge, not just blackness, not just the other, so to speak, but the self also comes out of that process. Was there a, a school of anti-racist thought in the ancient world? Uh, I, I, absolutely. I think that the 
the, the biggest corollary, and I'm not the first one to say this, there have been people who've sort of been working on this notion, but for the Greeks, there is a really strong opposition of Greek and barbarian that emerges. And that, in some ways, is much more akin to our black and white. You know, it has this either or. As you suggested, the Romans think of racially much more along a scale. They don't really have an either or. It's us and then all of these other constellations of difference. Um, but, but you find in fifth century writings, when just when the barbarian seems to be becoming a really powerful term, you also see Greek writers really thinking about it and unpacking it. So Herodotus had a reputation in later eras of being a lover of barbarians because of the way he really thought about that term. And um, Greek tragedy does the same thing. I think Euripides is, is a great example of this. So he writes these plays in which he's really trying to think about not so much are they different, he doesn't really go after that, but he goes after the question of superiority. Mm -hmm. If there are these two things, if there are Greeks and barbarians, why are we better when we're doing all of these other kinds of things? So he has this great... So he questions whether we're So he better. questions that, that not maybe not the, the tendency to want to divide these two, but the tendency to think of the Greeks as inherently better. So mm -hmm. not maybe racial thinking itself, where, but the where, second what, step... What of, plays does he do that? He does it really well in this play called Iphigenia um, Among the Taurians, which uh -huh. is a story of Iphigenia, and she's, she's taken, um, sort of captured and taken to this barbarian land. And her brother arrives to rescue her, and Euripides, in fact, makes the Greeks look more violent, more barbaric. Um, they violate certain religious rights along the way. And so he, he depicts this king of this local land, who's called a barbarian, in the text as asking all these questions about the Greeks. You know, even we wouldn't do this, this king says. Even barbarians wouldn't go so far as to do these things. And the whole story of Iphigenia is really based on familial violence. So there's this idea of, you know, the Greeks commit violence against themselves, and this barbarian king is really thinking about that. So I think, you know, Trojan women is another excellent mm -hmm. example of mm -hmm. that, where he's really trying to think about, you know, the aftermath of war, and the Greeks look um, extremely um, immoral, might be too strong a word, but, but they're, they're the problem of the play, and these Trojan women are the victims of all of this war. And the Greeks are sort of off stage, this very powerful absence. And um, the Trojan women are the, the characters who fill the play, and they're trying to deal with the aftermath of wars. The Greeks are just arbitrarily taking possession of them. So this idea that you sort of have this pathos on the stage, and these Greeks who are in control off the stage, but who in fact are making decisions that were um, conditioned to really find problematic. So is is, is there a kind of undercurrent of opposition to slavery in, the, in that uh, play as well? Um, I would say... You shouldn't be doing this to Catholic women? I think that's a great question. Um, I think it's... They certainly are going to be enslaved. It, it seems a little bit more about gender to me than about slavery per se. So although they're going to be enslaved by the Greeks, um, I think um, it's a little bit more focused on this question of what violence does to these women and how they're... But the, so you, the Euripides thinks this is wrong, or there yes, seems I think to that, be... Yes, the play, and, and there's actually this Greek messenger who has to go back and forth between these Trojan women. So they're gathered, and the idea is that they're going to be divided up by the Greek um, conquerors. And you have this messenger who goes back and forth between these absent Greeks and these Trojan women, and he's actually a really sympathetic character. And you can tell in the course of the play that he um, has has a difficult time with the orders that he's given. So you sort of see through his eyes when he has to tell these women, you know, one of your children is going to be killed, or you have to, you know, you have to leave now, you're going to uh, go here, that, that he in fact um, finds that a difficult thing to do. So it, it's not a statement of victory, it's really about the, the victims of all of this. And, and I think very gendered, because the women are really standing in for this fallen city. The men have been killed in the Trojan War, and the women are what's left of this once great city. And as they try to figure it all out, they're extremely sympathetic. Um, and the Greeks off stage, I think, are not sympathetic. People talk about Medea the same way. Would the, would the Romans have had similar types of thoughts, or is it would have been un-Roman to uh, think in that way, this sort of universalistic compassion mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. is the undercurrent here? Um, there are some philosophies of sort of compassion among the Romans, but um, at least um, it's hard to find a genre that takes them up in the same way that tragedy does. I guess I would say that. So um, you have these ideas that are emerging in the Roman world of a kind of 
community of human beings, but that doesn't certainly doesn't stop the Roman imperial project, and you don't see people agonizing. I guess one of the places you might find it is in the series of court cases where um, Cicero, for example, is involved in trying um, cases that have involved Roman abuse in the provinces. Mm -hmm. And so there's where you get maybe a little bit more of that idea, what, what's actually happening in these encounters, and, and are the Romans actually behaving well in all of it? That might be the best place to live. Stoicism had that quality. Yes, so exactly, that, exactly. That's right. Law. Exactly, exactly. That's originally Greek and then spread exactly, into the Exactly, into the Roman So world. you see upper class Romans taking on certain the philosophies like Stoicism, but you don't see it necessarily applied to questions of imperialism. Um, although, you know, with people like Tacitus, you start to get certain kinds of critiques of that the, emperor, that the empire is overreaching and starting to lose control of itself. Well, Tacitus' view of the Germans, if I recall, is, is, is often of kind of a noble, savage, absolutely, superior absolutely, in many ways absolutely. to the Romans. So here you have a kind of reverse, it's a little like Herodotus. Absolutely. Maybe historians are kind of inclined to do yeah, this, yeah. a little like Herodotus coming mm -hmm, back and talking mm -hmm, about the virtues mm -hmm, of, of mm -hmm. others. Um, and I think that's what that you know your question is so important because I think that's what makes this so rich. We often think of you know the Greeks and Romans as being one dimensional and, and having certain ideas, but there are trends of critique that exist along with, uh, alongside it. Mary Beard did this great study of the Roman triumph, and one of the things she says in it is that the societies that are most militaristic are often the ones that are most critical about the use of force, and I think that's what you see sometimes with someone like a Tacitus, you know, what's happening to this imperial project? Um, why should the Germans be morally better if we're actually, and, and they don't defeat the Germans, but in certain ways they feel more powerful than the Germans, but they have this sense of, at least with someone like Tacitus, being corrupted in their very ambitions. Do we, do we know anything, and I, I realize that any, anyone only can know so much, but <laughs> okay, do, yeah. do, we, do we know very much about the other peoples of the uh, ancient Mediterranean mm -hmm. and how they regarded themselves. I guess we know a good deal about mm -hmm. the Hebrews from their mm -hmm. scripture. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, more generally, uh, these questions arise in Greek culture. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have any sense of how they arose, if they did at all, uh, in the cultures of the Egyptians or the Sumerians mm -hmm. or the Assyrians or whoever? I think that, um, so one of the things Perfect. I'm going to talk about tonight is certainly Egypt with mm -hmm. Cleopatra, and um, when, and I'm not an Egyptologist, I will say that, but my sense of when people think about race and the Egyptians, they look a lot at art, and there's some really interesting art in Egyptian tombs that depicts the Egyptian view of other groups of people. So you have these other groups of people coming to give um, honor to the Egyptian pharaoh, and they try to really think about that kind of ethnographic vision. How are these people being portrayed? And, and it's clear that there's a kind of type or stereotype that emerges. So you can see the Nubian, you can see the Syrian, you know, how the Egypt the Egyptians viewed people around them. And it's clear that these texts are about superiority. They're about Egyptian domination over these groups. Um, so that's one of the things that, that people do think of the ancient Egyptians as having their own racial... But did they have any second thoughts about well, whether, I, that's, whether I, that's, folks in... <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I, you know, I, I think it's... Um, that's a great question. I, I don't know where people go to for Egyptian ideas. There are some Amarna letters, and there's some, you know, some documents. I'm not, I'm not that well versed in. But Andromeda is an Ethiopian princess. Uh -huh, right. So how exactly. does how does that figure in the Greek view of of others? Mm -hmm. um, is, is 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 she normally thought of as being dark skinned in in the uh -huh. uh, Greek? Uh huh versions of the, of, the, of the story, well, Perseus goes Yeah, down, Perse right, 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 right. And right. he kills all her family. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. But and he likes her. <laughs> right, and there are wonderful <laughs> paintings of sea monsters coming after her. Um, that's something that I talk about a little bit in the book because she is shown, you know, one of the things that I, I argue is that, and, and there's a woman in England, Edith Hall, who's done a lot of work on mythology, and her um, argument, sort of what I try to demonstrate in Andromeda, is that when you get into very early myth, it, it, the, the Greeks don't have a good ethnographic sense of some of these places. So it's sort of like fairy tales, you know. So to place Andromeda in Ethiopia is, they don't show her different, you know, she's just in this kind of exotic it's just place. just a faraway place. It's just a faraway place. It's sort mm -hmm. of once upon a time, you know, and, but as the Ethiopian, as an ethnographic type, 
starts to infiltrate the Greek imagination. And this seems to be around the time of the Persian Wars where you, um, this is something Frank Snowden said, that for the first time you have black Africans actually serving in the Persian army, and so the Greeks would see them and, and have a better sense. Then you start to see, I think, more questions about the representation of Andromeda. So what was taken for granted was sort of, oh, she's a woman like we know women, mm -hmm transplanted to Ethiopia, now they're starting to think about what it means to actually be an Ethiopian woman. And some traditions will keep her white-skinned in this kind of once upon a time way, but you can see um, traditions that refer to her as dark-skinned. Um, Ovid does in one of his poems, and this is much later. Does, does Ovid do that? But there's a big sequence in, in Metamorphoses uh, about mm -hmm. Perseus and, mm -hmm. and a big fight mm -hmm. that I, I always thought was, was meant to kind of duplicate the Odysseus fight uh -huh, against, uh -huh. the, against the suitors. Right, right, right. Uh, right. So, so how does Ovid I, I believe he uses the word fusca, which is sort of dark-skinned. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and so there are other, and I think he uses her also in the Arsonatoria and calls her dark skin. So he uses a, a word that means not mm -hmm. white skin. Mm -hmm. So he seems to be attributing um, some kind of meaning to that um, label Ethiopian. Um, but Roman art at the same time still more often shows her as completely white skinned. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I try to grapple with in the book is sometimes you have a kind of ethnography that Ovid seems to be absorbing, but you also have an artistic tradition where people are copying earlier art. And so you don't really see her with dark skin very often in Roman wall painting. Um, but then um, later in the Roman Empire, there's this amazing text um, called The Ethiopian Story by Heliodorus, where he actually goes back and thinks about the precise problem of Andromeda being white in Roman wall painting. Um, and it's a really incredibly dense story where he's trying to think about what would possibly make an Ethiopian princess white. So there's a story, and in the story, this young woman finds out that she's Ethiopian, but she doesn't know why she's white. And there's this elaborate story that she's white because her mother was looking at a painting of Andromeda when she was conceived. So this is an incredibly dense story. You know, what is he really um, trying to think about? Is he trying to think about the absurdity of that artistic tradition? Is he trying to think about the power of representation? You know, there's a lot that's going on in there. But um, Daniel Selden, a classicist, has done a really interesting study of how important that story in particular was to African American thinkers in much later oh. generations. Mm -hmm. Because it, it looks to be this thinking through of that uh -huh. problem. Um, I think it's complicated, you know, like all literature, it's mm -hmm. really complicated how it goes about it, but it becomes this really important moment. And then some paintings and some other stories come out of that moment. So you can find paintings of this moment of this black Ethiopian queen looking at a picture of white Andromeda, and you know that the story is she's going to then give birth to a white. Um, There's also the, the the story of Queen Candace, I believe, mm -hmm, who kind mm -hmm, of led a mm -hmm. Nubian resistance. Yeah. And, yeah. and how is she imagined? Uh, she, I think, um, her physical descriptions are not very nice. She's often described as squinty-eyed, and the Romans, mm -hmm. you know, don't really, um, the, the accounts of her are not very flattering. But she holds tremendous power, and that's partially, probably why they are so unflattering to her. I don't know of any visual representations of her, so other than this sort of, um, you find these descriptors as you can in Roman texts. It's interesting texts. that the, the name has entered uh, mm -hmm. our, our naming system. Yeah. So, yes, yeah. yes. And I believe the name itself is actually just the Ethiopian word for queen. So although That's they refer right. to her as Candace or Kandake, um, in fact, we don't really know that much about who she would be from the Ethiopian perspective. Um, but there's, you know, she clearly, I, well, I shouldn't say clearly, nothing is clear, but she evidently um, is really able to stand up to Augustus, the first Roman emperor, and he, um, it looks like, has to come to terms with her, that he cannot defeat the Ethiopians, you know, sort of moving um, south from Egypt, and that, that he really has to settle with her in other ways. Um, so she's kind of an interesting character, I think, but, but hard to really get at in the sources. So let's, let's segue into a discussion of women oh, okay, uh, great, in, right, in right, antiquity and, right. and how they and the relation between the sexes mm -hmm. and sex roles were, were uh, envisioned in those mm -hmm. days. So you, you've done some work on, on Strabo mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, also on, uh, on Sophocles' uh, Electra. Yes, yes. Um, and in each case, you find the two authors, um, maybe more in Strabo's case, uh, wrestling uh, mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. what to think mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. the variety of, of, of mores governing, governing mm -hmm, uh, the relations mm -hmm. between the sectors in different places. So, uh, 
you, you, you think that this was kind of a, the, the supposition is that this, that this was sort of an issue for the Romans and for the Greeks, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and that they kind of struggled with it. So maybe, maybe you can enlarge mm -hmm, a little mm -hmm. bit on that. I, th I think that's a perfect topic, and it's certainly also for Cleopatra, you know, to think mm -hmm. about, there's certainly, um, I don't want to generalize too much, but, but if you think of, uh, about what ancient texts try to do, they often try to construct the idealized version of what a woman should be. Mm -hmm. And so there, when you reach these crises in the text, you, you find authors who are trying to come to terms with women who aren't acting like women, or maybe a better way to say it, women aren't acting feminine, that they're doing something that seems to take them out of what should be, for these authors, the sphere that women occupy. And often it's a kind of public sphere, it's a kind of political action. Um, and, then, and they're trying to think about what that means, not only about women, but also about men. Um, so you have this very famous story in, in the Greek side where this one um, sea captain is being beaten by a woman leader, evidently, and he says, you know, all my uh, men are becoming, all the women are becoming men and all my men are becoming women. This idea that women should have power over men seems to then feminize men, and that's where you see a lot of that. And, and Cleopatra is a perfect example mm -hmm. of that. How can we, um, how will the sources account for what seems like her intelligence, for one, I mean, that's often kind of left out of the accounts of her, um, by focusing on this particular dynamic with Antony and this idea that she is unmanning Antony, that she is the man in the relationship. And, and therefore, you know, you talk about race being a discourse that allows domination. This is the same kind of thing. If she's this aberration, if she's not only um, exercising authority in Egypt in ways that we don't like, which is really what it's about, but she looks like she is disrupting the whole natural order of things, then she becomes easier to mobilize um, hatred against and then to kill her. Um, so I think that's, that's what I'm sort of interested in, mm -hmm. is when these women stand out and become problems. Now Caesar takes her side. Caesar, in the yes, war. So yes. For yes, him, yes. Uh, he's 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 willing to yes, back her absolutely. in the struggle with her brother. Absolutely. And I think one of the things I'll talk about tonight is this production of her Egyptianness is something that is very calculated in that later period because the Romans are dealing with a lot of I guess what we generally call client kings. You know, they have a lot of sort of patron relationships with people who are ruling in other areas. So it would not be a conceptual problem. You have these foreign kings going in and out of Rome all the time. You have these kind of alliances. Um, so there might be a little more titillation because it's sexual. You know, so the story is about sexuals. Um, Caesar's sexual liaison with Cleopatra. But as I'll talk about tonight, she comes to Rome, and you know, people seem to find it fascinating, but not outrageous. I, I'm not sure how much the Romans knew about the longer course of Ptolemaic history. I'm not sure how much I knew either. But, but Cleopatra was actually Cleopatra the eighth, wasn't she? She's the seventh. The seventh. Yes, I'm yes, sorry. The there seventh. you go. That's okay. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So there were there was a tradition on the Ptolemies. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, some of these earlier Cleopatras did have some power in their own right. They mm -hmm. they, they were just titular Absolutely. consorts of of, of of their brothers, I guess, in mm -hmm. many cases. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so, 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 is is that kind of a a strange feature of the Macedonian kingdom in Egypt that it it gave that much? Was it was it a result of the brother sister marriages, or was there some mm -hmm. other cause hmm. of that? That's a that's a great question. Um, I'm trying to think of. Um you know, one of the things when you talk about Caesar that he'll do is he will put Cleopatra on the throne. He really supports her right to rule. And that's a kind of interesting question because it, there are not political women in Rome itself. And so the question... Well, they're behind the scenes. They're behind the scenes, absolutely, absolutely. But, you know, we you can't have... You know, a woman run for consul the way women, you know, are starting to run for well. You can have a horse. Right. There you go. There you go. Right. Right. So, so it's sort of an interesting non-problem for Caesar in a way. And I think that that's that part of that. I think is um, the pragmatism of the Romans that this is going to suit him better. That this is um, a way he's going to be. Um, able to exert influence in Egypt. One of the, the, the dirty little secrets about the Romans in Egypt is that they have financial interests. And that's really why Caesar goes there. I mean, he goes there because they're at war, but the problem with the war is that it's, it's 
putting Roman money in jeopardy because mm -hmm. there are all sorts of loans that the mm -hmm. Romans have given. Mm -hmm. And um, so Caesar's really worried about money. I mean, he's worried about trying to make sure that the Romans can get these debts paid by people who now look like they're going to fall out of power. Are owed to the state of Rome? Or they're owed to, to private individuals. And, and what's sort of amazing, and um, it's kind of hard to recuperate from the sources, but what's amazing is that... Um, and you could, I guess you could think of modern analogies too, is getting the Senate involved in it. So you have these private factions who've loaned money, um, who want their money back, who are propping up um, Cleopatra's father, but they don't want it to fall entirely or they're gonna lose all of that money. Um, so they, they Caesar goes in and, you know, as his account tells us, I guess fights this you know, really important war, but um, he really has a very clear interest mm -hmm. in, in trying to make sure that he and his friends um, haven't just lost a lot of money. Well, initially he's he's chasing Pompey, isn't he? He um, uh, right. So there's there's the whole way in which it, it plays into the Roman civil wars as well. So so these 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 Macedonian queens in mm -hmm. in, in Egypt, mm -hmm. you don't find that elsewhere. I think in the other Hellenistic states, the other. Uh, states of the successors. Um, so why is that? If it, maybe I'm, I'm wrong, but, that I, right. but if that's right, that's right, why why does it occur? Uh, do you think uh, in um, Egypt? I think that, and this might be a source problem. Um, Alexandria, when the Ptolemies, this Macedonian dynasty, are ruling after the death of Alexander the Great, it's where there's a lot of literature written, and you find literature in praise of some of these queens. So I guess I'm just sort of wondering out loud, oh. if you had evidence from other parts of the world, you might find you know, that, that queens were built up in the same way. But we have mm -hmm. art that depicts them, mm -hmm. certainly. Mm -hmm. you know, so that there's certainly a major part of public culture, there's no question about that. And I'm, but I'm just wondering if that's partially the culture that Were they considered up. to be joint rulers? Um, I don't, ooh, that's a great question. Um, I, I suppose that, the, I mean, so Cleopatra, yes, yes, right, yeah. I think that's right, yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes, um, yes, and certainly, and, you know, Cleopatra is much older than her brother that she's married to, so she, you know, exerts a great deal of influence at that point in time, so that's kind of a, you know, that it's an extreme form of endogamy to really keep these Ptolemies um, in power. But um, yes, but she's, I think she is the one in control there. So let's, let's sort of uh, take a look more broadly. Oh, well, I mean, the, 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 we can stay with Cleopatra's <laughs> fascinating subject. But uh, what, how does the status of, of women differ Greek, Greece versus Rome? Um, I think that uh, generally speaking, and you sort of alluded to this before, and, and part of this, again, is a source issue because we have a lot of accounts of the Roman imperial family. And so there is this idea that women exercise greater indirect political power mm -hmm. during the Roman Empire. And that um, they certainly, we can find sources from Roman Egypt where women have um, some economic power as well. So some, you know, they're able to enter into contracts in certain ways. And this is uh, really important, you know, it's a kind of, um, it's hard to get, for example, when I teach this material to my students, it's hard to get them kind of excited about the idea that if you have three or four children, you can, um, I believe it's three, um, you can conduct contracts without a guardian. You know, it sort of sounds like a very minor right, but when you think about what it allows women to do during the Roman period, it allows them to exercise a great deal of influence. And, and you can see this in some of the papyri that survive from Egypt. That women that, are, that's true even if the husband is living. Correct, correct. It's sort of this mm -hmm. reward as, as they're trying to um, really encourage. So that's the idea? It's a reward for yeah, producing Yeah, so it's, it's a kind of incentive that for... the empire? It's, yes. Uh -huh. um, so it's this sort of incentive to rebuild, really, the Roman upper class. So once you have a certain it's, number it's of Augustus children, does it? Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, now, and, and the situation in, in Greece, we're not, we're, again, you think it may be a source question rather than a reality question, but, but uh -huh. the, the, the kind of conventional Right. view of, right. of women in Athens, right. say. Right. Right. I guess women in Sparta were a good deal freer. Right, I, I mean, yeah. and that's generally the presumption. It's a little bit tough because a lot of our sources are actually Athenian. So they're using Spartan women as a counterexample to Athenian women. But it looks like, I don't want to be too, you know, right. parse it down too much, but it does look like um, because of the nature of Spartan society, which was much more militaristic and built around this kind of egalitarianism, that it looks like women did have more role, a more public role. Um, 
And so I think in, in Athens, people generally presume, and, and a lot of it is built on this dichotomy of what is private versus public. And so if you think about where Athenian women would be in public, it has a lot to do with religion, for example. That seems to be one role that women have that's extremely important in Athenian public life. But you don't see them exercising what we would call, I think, political influence, except if you're thinking about what they might do in the space of their own home. You know, they might be influencing the votes of their husbands in certain ways, but um, you don't see prominent wives of politicians, except for Aspasia. I mean, she's a great example with Pericles. She, um, she's a hetero. She is, uh, yes, yes. And, and, and he, you know, is extremely intelligent. And she's and an advisor to him. She's supposedly an advisor to him, and he will eventually have, I believe it's only one child with her, but he will get that child recognized as fully Athenian, which is mm -hmm. actually contrary to his own law. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, she's a really interesting, uh, ex maybe counterexample or of the possibility. Now, both these societies, and this has always been of some interest to me, mm -hmm. um, and again, correct me if I'm kind of mm -hmm. in error, but both societies are, at the legal level, monogamous. That's correct, yes, absolutely. And, and this is a big difference between Greece and Rome, mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. the societies further east and mm -hmm. to the south, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I think mm -hmm. were all, if you had enough money, mm -hmm. man with enough money, were mm -hmm. all, were all pol allowed polygamy. Mm -hmm. Certainly mm -hmm. Hebrews allowed polygamy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what accounts for that? That strikes me as something very important at the foundation right. of kind of future European development. Right. So what, what accounts right. for that? Um, well, I think... Um, this would be my, my guess, I guess my best guess would be it's, it's really about, when you read about marriage in the Greek and Roman world, and this is also a source question, but you tend to hear about upper class marriage. And so there's all sorts of sort of common law marriages that can happen with freed women and, and um, lower economic classes, and they don't seem to be a concern for the Romans, for example, as much. So it looks like marriage is really understood to be among the Greek and then the Roman upper classes a way of holding on to property, a way of really um, thinking about property rights, how families join together, how they join property, how property can be distributed. So that's um, what I would say. It's really about a kind of class boundary that has to do with how property is preserved in but, families. But, but still, in, in other societies where they're mm -hmm. also concerned about property, mm -hmm. Uh, the notion is that, uh, that uh, a man with the resources can, mm -hmm. can have more than a single mm -hmm. wife, mm -hmm. still today in mm -hmm. some parts of the world. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm just wondering right. why right. these societies, uh, mm -hmm. rather exceptionally, I don't mm -hmm. know if there are many mm -hmm. other examples. Mm -hmm. um, the Japanese, well I think they did allow for plural mm -hmm. marriages, don't seem to have had as much of that as, say, mm -hmm. the Chinese did. Mm -hmm. So there's some mm -hmm. variation elsewhere. But, I, I, I mean, I, it's an interesting question right, to think about. Right, right. It's well, a, and, I, you know, yeah. and I I guess I, I don't know enough about polygamy, I guess, to sort of, it's actually a question I've never thought about, but it's a great question. Um, I think uh, one of the things that seems to also be a concern about marriage, which is not unusual historically, is also the production of children and this idea of legitimate children. And so the, the Greeks in particular, there's been a lot of really important work on this. David Halperin's done some amazing work on things like Athenian prostitution. So there is no stigma against sexual acts outside of marriage. What marriage seems to be designed around is this kind of clear possession of property and then also clearly understood succession of children. Mm -hmm. um, and so that might be part of it Both as in well. Greece and Rome. Both in Greece and Rome. But I think it's important to remember we have even really good evidence for this in Rome that divorce also exists in Rome and, the, and my students are always shocked to Not find that out. Um, it, it is possible in Greece, we just don't have, we get more and more sources for it um, into the Hellenistic period mm -hmm. when we get these sources from Egypt. So that's part of, in Athens we don't have um, a lot of good personal documents that survive. Um, but, but, and then when you get into the Hellenistic period and see in Egypt then um, the process of divorce, then you get a lot of crisis about dowries. You know, what's going to happen to the property that the wife brought in? And that's where you really see some of these concerns emerging. What do you think the existence of divorce as an institution signifies? That's a great <clears> question. <throat> um, yeah, I think you tend to hear about it and mostly. And overclass Romans do it a lot. They do it a lot, right. right. So you think about it more yeah. as a Roman institution um, or Roman possibility, maybe. Um, 
I think, you know, when you hear about it in terms of the Roman really upper class and really super elites, um, it, it seems to be a lot more about political opportunity mm -hmm. than even really economic so opportunity. Tangling and untangling family lines. Yes, family yes, and creating, yeah. exactly, exactly. And I think that, um, you know, just to give a nod to pop culture, if you w if you watched HBO's Rome series, and, and I like that for many reasons, but one of the things that I think that it captures really well is what must have been the unbelievable crisis during the Roman civil wars and the, uh, and the attempt to keep on the right side of people. And that seems to be really, you know, so you would have, I think, families who are aligned with each other one day and then not the next day. And I think that's you know, divorce is sort of about that as well, trying to be flexible in terms of how your family is aligned in public life. Um, and uh, so, you know, Antony is involved in a very famous divorce of Octavian's sister, uh, which is going to get him into did, a lot of did trouble. Did women frequently initiate divorces? Um, I think when you get down to some of this more documentary evidence from the Hellenistic and then Roman periods in Egypt, you do find some interesting sources. It generally has to be... I think instigated by their fathers, so they have to have some sort of Those help in doing that. Parents. Correct. But I think you know the emotional content of uh -huh. that decision. I mm -hmm. think you wouldn't want to disregard the fact that women may want a divorce. But I think to go through the process of getting a divorce usually requires um, the assistance and really the um, uh, the lead of men in their families. Um, but there's some amazing documents from. Uh, Greco-Roman Egypt where you get much more of the emotional content of some of these relationships and you have um, divorce um, communications um, or proceedings that allude to things like violence, you know, domestic violence. And um, so you see, it, I think, a really interesting picture of some of the things that don't always come across when you think of marriage as an economic institution or a certain kind of institution. The position of women in, in Roman law strengthens with time from the Republic to the early Empire? That's generally, yes, mm -hmm. and um, there's often, this was sort of popular in the 60s and 70s and working through this idea of the new woman mm -hmm. in Augustan Rome, that when Augustan Rome, who he'll be the first, we would call him Roman Emperor, he never really takes that title himself, but that things begin coming out of this period of civil wars in fact, you know, people have talked about how the social fabric of Rome seems to really be unsettled. And you can think about, you know, when I talk to my students, I think about things like Rosie the Riveter during World War um, II. You know, you get this idea that when you undergo catastrophic social changes, sometimes certain um, roles shift. And I think that's often the thought that in the Augustan Rome, women start having more freedoms. Um, it's a little bit... Um, problematic because a lot of that argument comes from literary sources. Mm -hmm. So there's an idea that women have greater sexual freedom, for example, and, and people will make that argument from Roman love poetry. And that's a little bit complicated. Um, I mean, I think it's an interesting idea, but when you're talking about love poetry, you're talking about these male poets complaining about female promiscuity. So to what extent are women, are women really you know, exercising greater sexual freedom versus being accused of it in this poetry? So most of the, the sources that, that you've looked at, Strabo mm -hmm. and uh, Sophocles, mm -hmm. um, to get a sense of male-female mm -hmm. relationships and roles, uh, these are kind of male writers. Yes, yes. Uh, they absolutely. may be very empathetic absolutely. male, but they're male writers. Absolutely. So how much do we know, whether it's via male writers mm -hmm. or via Mm -hmm. female writers mm -hmm. occasionally. How much do we know about how women saw themselves mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in these societies? Do mm -hmm. we have much evidence of that? I think that's, you know, one of the things, um, I was a graduate student at Duke University and, and they have one of the best pepperological collections in the country. And so I sort of got a little bit of exposure to it, although I kept on my literary track myself. But um, the more I taught, and, and as a background to the race book, the more I got interested in this papyrological evidence, and this papyri that survives from um, Egypt during the Greek and Roman periods of occupation. And to me, that's some of the most exciting evidence, because you really get personal letters from people. You get these contracts that are you know, between two individuals, and, and you can sort through them to figure out other kinds of feelings and representation. So I would say, as a classicist now, if I was telling students what kind of uh, evidence would you look to, I'm, I'm really interested in papyri. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's tough because I'm not a trained papyrologist. You know, then you reach all those disciplinary Are there vast boundaries. archives of papyri unexamined? Uh, 
Uh, they're getting better and better, and in fact, they're putting them online. So I teach a course in Greco-Roman Egypt, and my students can now go online and see what a papyrus looks like. They're written in Greek. They're written mostly in Greek, yes. Mm -hmm. There are some in Latin, um, you get a little bit of Demotic, a little bit of Coptic, but mainly it's Greek. Um, and and there, you know, there's been a wonderful project out of the University of Michigan to put up these and do cooperating with it, putting these papyri up, translations of them, which is really important for the students. So, you know, they're they're phenomenal sources. So to me, that was a kind of moment of getting used to thinking what our limitations were, and then you encounter this evidence, and it still, you know, has its problems. I mean, there are only certain things that people are going to put into writing. It's a lot of legal cases, mm -hmm. but you do get some letters, um, which are just, I think, amazing. Well, let's let's conclude with Strabo. Okay, happened. let's conclude. Right. And and he uh, writes about the among many of many things, but he writes about the Amazons. Yes, yes. And the uh, where to put the Amazons right, is, right, right, is, is one right. of his challenges. Right. Um, first off, do we have any sense of what the foundation of the legend of the Amazons is? Uh, and if so, what are your thoughts um, on that? So I just have to put in a plug for one of your earlier conversations uh, with Dr. Ian Morris because one of the things that he was really interested in is the role of geography and, and Strabo is a geographer and, and he's really thinking through this question of Amazons geographically and exactly as you say, where do they actually live as he's putting together this monumental account of what the world looks like in the period of Augustus. That's what, it's its a kind of difficult source to work through but so important. Is it Greek or Roman? He is, he writes in Greek himself, so he's coming on into this Greek literary tradition. Um, and he uh, really wants to record the world as it exists under Augustan power. So it's an incredibly, I would say, political text. But it presents itself as an encyclopedia, which is what makes it kind of hard to approach. And for a long time, people just used Strabo to answer certain questions. What did we know about you know, X? And they would open it. But to read it all the way through is a slog. But you, you get some of these ideas. So that's what I just wanted to say I was so interested in, in hearing this persistence. And I'll talk about it also tonight, that you know the, the ancient Greeks and Romans are thinking about people, partially how they're located in the world. So the Amazons, um, there's been some archeological excavations to try to determine, is there a historical basis for what we might consider to be warrior women? That is, in the part of the world where they are often located, can we find evidence And that's of, the Caucasus or the Yes, Arabs? that's correct, that's correct. So ancient Scythia. So where people, everybody's fighting it. Uh, yes, exactly, and so there seem to be um, tombs that show women taking on these warrior mm -hmm. roles. I think the caution is that the Amazons become so important in Greek mythology that they become really separate out from, I think, any kind of reality. Um, so it might be that the, the Greeks have heard stories of women riding horses and having this, but they elaborate the myth and it's so, so useful that to them. women fought with the Scythians at times, isn't there? I yeah, so that's right, exactly, right, exactly. So yeah. that would be the kind of area mm -hmm. that the, the Greeks would be thinking about. And so um, you see them, um, it's, it's actually one of the challenges of teaching the Amazons because there's a story about them in Herodotus, but we don't have lengthy narrative accounts. What we tend to have are, is Greek art about mm -hmm. Amazons. And so they appear in really interesting ways on Greek pottery. Um, and one of the things that, that people have shown in I think a really fascinating way is that progressively, so as you get from the 6th century into the 5th century, the Amazons start looking more and more like Persians. And so what it looks like is that the Athenians are using the Amazons to really think about the Persian mm -hmm. Wars. You know, what is it like to fight this group that is so quintessentially other to us? And so they kind of lump the Amazons in certain ways together. And the Persians didn't have, as far as we know, any military women in their own. Correct, right. correct. It's just sort of this, so they start wearing um, clothing that looks Persian, and they seem to be this kind of stand-in for thinking about the Persian Wars, which the Greeks were sort of setting up ideologically as this cataclysmic encounter of this group that was completely different. And so just as men are different to women, Greeks are different to Persians. It was sort of this analogous thinking that they engaged in. And um, so the, the depiction of Amazons actually starts to change in art, and they become more Eastern, for example. As I say, they wear this clothing that really looks like Persian clothing. Um, so I think it's very particular how that myth is used in 5th century Athens, which is some of our best evidence. So they appear on the shield of Athena um, on the Acropolis in the Parthenon. So you see, you know, in the 5th century, they kind of are a really important idiom for the Greeks in thinking about superiority and conflict with 
you know, the other, if you want but, to put it that way. But the, the, the Greeks regard the Amazons as very formidable? They did, yes, they did, they did. And um, so there's a kind of, um, I would say, attraction, repulsion. Mm -hmm. You know, they're mm -hmm. very attracted to this idea, even though if we go back to that notion that, that Greek literature establishes an idea, what could be less the ideal woman for the Greeks than this warrior women who pointedly, you know, one of the stories, the, the word Amazon comes from, um, this idea of lacking a breast, um, as, oh, so, so the Greeks thought that they had actually mm -hmm. defaced their female bodies in order to do some of this fighting. But there is an attraction, there's no question. Mm -hmm. And later on in the tradition, to partially alleviate this kind of conceptual threat of the Amazons, there'll start to be stories of um, falling in love with the Amazons. And that's where you start to get the story of Achilles, who falls in love with Penthesilea the minute that he kills her. And you start to get these really erotic, then, visions of the that Amazons. That sort of carries over into medieval Absolutely, uh, absolutely, exactly, exactly. So in the first artistic depictions, with they're Muslim really... Muslim women often, uh, sort of crusaders and... Yes, women. and, you know, Alexander the Great has mm -hmm. a story of meeting Amazons, and it's mm -hmm. very erotic. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, they're really not eroticized. They're, uh -huh. you know, much more this kind of conceptual difference. But then I think as a way to kind of alleviate these anxieties then they become locked mm -hmm. in these um, sort of erotic narratives and the, the ones of Achilles falling in love at the moment that he's killing this Amazon queen that you just see that again and again and again and it's a, it's an amazing image um, the way it's portrayed but I think it's kind of to diminish her power really um, to think that it can be contained within this act of falling in love by Achilles so on the one hand they kind of built up this image of formidable exactly. female warriors exactly. and on the other exactly. hand they wanted somehow to... And they'll translate into this little rom-com or something, this romantic comedy that can be, you know, diffuse some of the real threat. And of course her threat is also diffused as because it's really at the moment that he's killing her. So there's this, you know, um, acknowledgement of difference that becomes not so much formidable as a kind of erotic um, but then he's also uh, is Medea an Amazon? Okay. She's not quite an Amazon, but she's certainly a barbarian. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's throughout. She calls herself a barbarian, absolutely. And that's another play where Euripides is thinking through uh -huh. Greeks versus mm -hmm. barbarians, and that's a tough play to grapple with, I think, in modern times, um, because um, it looks like in some ways he's more sympathetic to Medea than we might be comfortable with knowing the outcome, which is an extremely brutal outcome yeah. when she mm -hmm. kills her children. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's sort of hard to imagine, looking backwards, that he might have sympathy, um, but it looks like he really does. I mm -hmm. mean, she's really trapped in this situation, and, and the Greek Jason is not shown well in Euripides' play. He's sort of this kind of coward who doesn't really want to face her, and um, so it's a, that's a complicated play, too, to go back to some of the ways that the Greeks are already thinking about racial ideas. Well, this has been fascinating. Thank I'm you. Sorry thank you. I really enjoyed it. Yes. Uh, longer. But uh, thank you for being here. Thank you. Yes. And um, we will continue with Institute Encounters uh, uh, next time around. Uh, we will be having Norma Thompson, who is an authority on Tocqueville, uh, and that will be our next event. Perfect. Thank but, you. but thank you, Denise. Thank you. This has been great.